Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OEG Emerging Leaders November webinar on women in technology. My name is Samantha Ogan, and I'm the OEG staff liaison for the Emerging Leaders. Um, this is our call is being um, currently it's being recorded. Um, so we do highly encourage you to ask questions, but we'll ask at the end. But if any time you do have questions during the web webinar, don't hesitate to write it in the questions box, and I'll um, forward them on to our panelists. Um, and then this recorded version of the webinar will be uploaded on the Emerging Leaders website by tomorrow. So if you do have any areas of focus that you wanted to jot down, don't worry, we'll have it available for you on the website. Um, before we start today's webinar, I want to talk about some news and other helpful opportunities for you to take advantage of in the coming months. The first thing I want to talk about is the new name. So if some of you may have been involved with the OEG Young Professionals, um, we have changed the group to the OEG Emerging Leaders, and that's why I wanted to mention the change just in case you haven't noticed. Um, the name change was driven by the committee that worked on the OEG Young Professionals and now is working on the Emerging Leaders, and it was made in an effort to focus on the group's mission of helping young and new Oracle application professionals grow in their career and as leaders. The group will continue to grow and evolve to help you network with your peers and mentors, as well as continue to host webinars like today's. So if you have any questions about the name, name change, don't hesitate to contact me. Next, I did want to give you three opportunities to continue learning after this webinar. Um, first, one of our panels, um, panelists did write a helpful blog post called Eliminating Gender Bias at Work. So if you want to read her tips, don't um, forget to go to oeg.org slash blog. Um, next, the Collaborate 18 registration will be opening this week, so watch for an announcement on that. Um, this is a great way to attend ed educational sessions to help you in your day-to-day, -day. but you can also network. Um, there is a Women in Technology luncheon and panel available at Collaborate, and we also have our Emerging Leaders Cocktail Meetup which is a meetup that brings mentors on different subjects that you can um, chat with um, in a more casual setting. And finally, we are on the last days of our Revenue Recognition Week. So if you want to know more about the new requirements and the implementation options, find out more at RevRec Week on the OEG website. And if you missed one of the sessions, don't worry, we did record all of them and they are available on the e-learning page for you. All right, with that, I do want to get started at the topic at hand, which is our Women in Technology panel. And first, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists today. Um, first, um, I'd like to introduce um, Kamal Goyal. Um, she's the one who will be leading the panel today. Um, she's a technologist and serial enter entrepreneur who dared to enter the Indian market with a liquor product line in 2007, and then she sailed through the global downturn. Currently, she is running 6E Technology as an Oracle service provider and loves to get her hands into solution designing for her clients. Since she grew up as a programmer, she loves to geek out at conferences, especially with Kaylin. Um, and then that leads me to um, Kellen Potvin Gorman, and she's a member of Oak Table Network an Oracle Ace, and an Oracle Ace Direct or alumni. She is the Technical Intelligent Manager for the Office of CTO at Delphix, a company recognized for its impressive virtualization and data masking environment capabilities. Um, she is also known for her expertise in multi-platform database management, cloud migrations, virtualization development, environment optimization, tuning automation, and architecture design. Um, she also has a great blog, dbakevlar.com. Um, and her social media handle is the same, and it's well respected for her insight and content. And then finally, last but not least, this is a Raju. Um, she's a deputy division chief for the financial, HR, and administrative services at the International Monetary Fund. She has over 20 years of IT experience delivering business value through technology. Um, she's a civil engineer by training with a master's in business administration. She's on the board for Robotics for Youth, which is a nonprofit that strives to improve STEM literacy in middle and high schoolers with a special focus on young women. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over.
Thank you, Sam. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hope you are enjoying your day. We got some snow this morning in Denver. So I am actually enjoying that weather for a change. Um, well, um, with that, I uh, first of all, uh, Samantha, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about women and technology and presenting two great leaders that I, I think uh, should be introduced to our young uh, emerging uh, leaders and uh, you know, sort of put a role model in front of them. Um, we, I can't stress enough that we do not have in, enough women leadership in place right now where our young women, entre uh, young women um, technologists can look up to and say, yes, that's where I want to go. So, so thank you so much, uh, Sam and uh, uh, Smith and Ke uh, Kellen for joining us today. I'm going to present a um, couple, um, couple of slides to just set the stage as to where this conversation is going. Most of the, uh, most of the panels that I have attended my intention or, or ran in the past, my intention is to have at least two takeaways. And um, and this, you know, I'm gonna run the panel today with the same intention to make sure that we have at least two takeaways from this panel and make make them actionable because we can sit here and talk all day long and not have any action taken. And that's where um, where I think um, a difference has to be made. So having said that, um, I'm starting my presentation. Um, Sam, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, this, uh, this particular, um, I love this quote from uh, Madeleine Albright. I, I hope you all remember who she was. She was Secretary of State during first Clinton administration. And uh, this particular um, quote comes from her saying, no matter what we do as women, we, do, we truly have to perform extra to make that impact because, um, we, you know, we are not taken seriously I, and and i'm you know there's no joke about it the in in a meeting when we uh when women are there and men are there uh, at the same time women have to make their point extra hard and then it ends up with mansplaining uh at the end of the conversation where a man explains what a woman is saying um and i have had multiple conversations about this uh, with kellen in the past but Yes, you know this is this is the reality. We have to work extra hard. We have to go an extra mile um, and make our presence felt, which is kind of a shame, but it's what it is. And uh, and we have to uh, sort of live with it, but make best out of that situation as well. Next slide, please. Um, so having said that, uh, Sam, let's go to the next slide. Um, I, I want to just bring some numbers here to put the things in perspective. Um, the reason I like to uh, like to quote and uh, talk about these numbers is uh, th there is, you know, there are surveys done behind what the women are feeling right now in the marketplace. Why we are, you know, why we feel that there is not enough representation. It's not just an arbitrary comment that we are making here this is something that is is uh that is proven by numbers by doing multiple surveys and the studies um and and it is it's pretty interesting to see across the entire c-suite of uh fortune top uh, thousand companies and this is a study done by forbes uh, mind you um, only 25 percent of titles are with uh, c-suite and uh, are with women um which is which is actually if you think about it we uh we are about what 51.8 percent uh, women population in this world in this country and on top of that we hold the hold the strings of the pocketbook now if you think that demographic is not given the decision-making power, there is something wrong with this picture. 19% of women are at CIO position with Fortune 1000 companies. 11% of women are CIO position in techno technology companies. Only 17.5% of women are at CIO position in Fortune 500 
companies. And this is this is coming from Corn Ferry Research. And this is very latest research as late as 2016. And, um, and the CIO journal says at US-based firms with 500 million revenue or above, a typical CIO is a 51-year-old male. Now, if you, um, if you look at these numbers, they truly look grim uh, from, a, from a leadership standpoint. If we do not have uh, representation up top at the leadership level, we, we won't be able to make decisions for people who are below and are ready to get to those, uh, those uh, you know, in, in C-suite. So I take these numbers very seriously. Now, these numbers are only numbers if until we make a difference we we actually take some action to change these numbers so what is constituting constituting these numbers is one reason that i have been following quite a bit and kellen can um, attest to it when she starts speaking uh, and i ask her some questions is uh, is that we lose technologists on the way during their career while, while they are you know women technologists are lost either they change the career or they leave the field to go to another field so that's where i want to find out what can we change in our in today's environment to keep those technologists in the field and get them to the c-suite now sam let's move to the next slide please um, some more tidbits and some more interesting facts here. One in four women say they are interrupted while talking in the meetings. Um, men want women to behave like men to be able to succeed. I have heard this multiple times that you, you need to be as, uh, as aggressive as men. You need to be bossy as men. Um, I, I've, you know, I, I've been in this industry for about 21 years now, and I've heard it multiple times. Um, the other one is, uh, this kind of um, uh, makes me uh, laugh, when women are in minority, they don't speak in meetings, um, but the opposite is not true. So have you been in a meeting where there are more women and one man? You will you will notice that men don't don't stop, but they'll make their uh, their presence felt. Um, so and then look at this one a study by Yale School: uh, men who are angry are rewarded. Women who are angry are considered that they don't have control over their emotions. Nice. That's that's actually a very nice. <laughs> Nice observation on Yale School's part. Anyway, let's move to the next one. Um, so, you know, the reason I'm trying to put these facts as as my foundation of this particular panel is um, these are facts. These are not, you know, these are not something. This is not something that um, has been arbitrarily being said by women. This, this is these, this is these facts are researched and proven and we need to find out how to shift and how to move the needle from that point um, so you know in most of the um, I love this slide and by the way this slide was created by Kellen just just as a disclaimer here um, you know this is I love the slide because there is a perception about women uh, leaders and specifically in technology because that field is really male dominated and is um, and 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 we have very little representation in that particular field so um, how are we viewed how are we perceived from outside um, you know are we being bossy if we are trying to be boss we are being uh, viewed as bossy if we are um, you know what is the difference between uh, being emotional versus analytical um if we are putting our point forward if we are if we are trying to make a case we are considered abrasive um these are a couple of things that i would like to start you know talking about with my panel in a couple minutes but but you can see where where we are going with this um uh, Sam, can you go to the next slide, please? I'll, I'll go through this really quick and then get uh, Kellen, uh, Kellen and uh, Smith involved. So, um, you know, we all know we, you know, using the numbers that I just showed and and the perception about women in, especially in technology, we know there is bias. Now, 
let's talk about it and find out what we can do. Um, and one of the reasons I'm really interested in addressing these young professionals is we do not want to lose the technologists at the young age that I have seen many of, many, many, many of my friends just leaving the technology uh, uh, technology field and either completely leaving the workforce, but if they're not leaving the workforce, they will actually come back as non-technologists and and continue their career, which kind of is a shame because we do have a lot of uh, a lot of talent within us. So with that, um, um, Kellen, can you can you hear me? If you if you can, just say yes, and then the first question is going to be for you. I can. I can hear okay. you. Thank you, Kamal. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Kellen. Thanks for joining, uh, guys. Just to let you know, she is hardcore technologist, um, and I get to geek out with her at times. Uh, she's uh, She's a DBA programmer, not only just on Oracle side, she's also a SQL Server DBA. So you can imagine how technically savvy one has to be working on both sides of the technology. So thank you, Kellen. Um, thank my you. First, first question to you is, uh, um, you started really early in your career um, and uh, as, as a technologist, what work, give me a couple of examples, maybe two examples of where you almost felt like this is it. This is it. I can't take it anymore unless I have some kind of support or I have to stand up for myself or I'll have to leave this field. Um, I did start out pretty early as a DBA and uh, I, I lucked out. My husband and I have a very rare situation, at least on the Oracle side, where we started out in the same industry. He was my first mentor, and that really was my saving grace. Uh, my first position that I had as a DBA, I worked for a DBA that was a bit of a bully, and she had created a situation that caused the first junior DBA that I worked with, I was also a junior DBA there, to leave the industry after nine months. Um, within my first five years of my career, 40% of the women I worked with had already left. I didn't understand why, and some of it came from my own personality because, well, I just don't listen to anybody but myself. Second was my mentors, that um, Tim Gorman had come into my company and had put an example in front of me that was really amazing, that I said, this is how a DBA should act, this is how they should you know, interact with other people. And when he had heard that I was going into the project management team, he had stepped up and went to my manager and said, you know, Kellen is learning our man faster than anybody else, hands down. She should stay a DBA, don't let her leave technology. And that manager listened to Tim and was able to come back in and make sure that I stayed tech. And I wanted that, I love technology. And that was really kind of a win for me. But we call it the death by a thousand pinpricks. Every woman that I had talked to from that point on, because I wanted to understand why they were leaving the industry, described very similar situations to my own. I had had the luck of one, being very, very stubborn, two, having those mentors that were there, and three, having sponsorships, people that went out of their way to make sure I stayed in the industry. Very good. So, um, in sh uh, in short, I would say that you know your own personality of being stubborn and uh, and uh, and and getting the right sponsorships at uh, at the right time to propel you in the direction you wanted to go. Absolutely, and it's happened repeatedly in my career. Um, I was lucky that uh, different folks came in and said, you know, Kellen, come work for me. Kellen, I love what you're doing on your blog. Kellen, I love the article you wrote. You know, consider working for me. And that I was blogging and I was presenting, which at times took away a lot of bias because my content, my capabilities were presented out there in a web format that was not impacted as much by me being a woman or presented as a woman. As you stated on your previous slide, one of the challenges that we have is bias. It can be an extremely invisible challenge. And people will automatically, as you know, I'm very forward. I, I worked with all men very quickly into my career by the time I was around eight years in, there were no women around me. And so I would emulate the men around me and I would notice what they would do and their the reaction to them for performing their tasks that way. I would do it and I would end up getting you know this, this backlash. 
And I recognized that I had to change the way that I address things. I had to be extremely strategic. I needed to make sure that I had all my I's dotted, all my T's crossed, because if I made any mistakes, I was also scrutinized at a higher level than my male peers. Well, that that kind of um, also reiterates what uh, what uh, Madeline Albright said. You have Absolutely. to work extra hard. Um, thank you so much um, for all the for all the attendees. If you have any questions going forward, just keep um, either sending them to Sam or write them, uh, and we will be giving about 10 minutes, last 10 minutes uh, for question answers. Um, but please feel free to send those questions to Sam. We will be taking them at the end. So, um, Smitha, um, this is for you. Uh, thank you again. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, no, I know we had the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, we're so excited to have you on the panel today. And thanks to Debbie, who introduced me to you. Um, after talking to you and knowing that you have twins, 11-year-old um, twins, correct? Uh, 13. 13 now. Okay, so um, so having said that, that kind of um, you know we all are mothers as well at the same time. Um, you know, I have two girls. Kellen has kids, and uh, with with uh, with you having twins and continuing your career and making to where you are today, um, my first question to you is, uh, what uh, what is it in women who want to st what would be one or two qualities that you would tell our young professionals to stick to and be with them uh, to to make to where you are today in the in the industry well um well uh, I'll thank you again for the opportunity and as Como nicely noted I'm a mother of um, 13 year old twins so which is quite a journey from starting from when they were toddlers so um, I, I would sort of preface my answer with the statement that you know in in my view my career wasn't sort of a pre-planned um, activity but I've learned quite a bit in reflecting on what Kelly and just said you know there's a number of challenges that each one of us have to overcome right so I think that's the one thing that we can all attribute to so I would say that one as a woman in the IT industry you have to know that you want a career so this is a choice that you make so it's not a choice of an if and a then that it is a choice that you make knowing well ahead that you're not going to be perfect at everything all the time and that's okay being a mother you know a wife a sister a daughter balancing work with family it's not easy but as long as you are very clear you want a career in the IT you know industry that's something that keeps you driving right and also be clear on when certain things take priority so there are certain phases in your life where life needs to take priority over career so you have a little bit of flexibility to plan it so for example when you have high schoolers you want to make sure they get into a good college and there's a little bit more focus on kids but when they're in you know elementary school do you need the same focus? No, probably that's the time you would focus on your career a little bit more. So there are phases in life that you can shift your focus, but you're not going to be perfect and perfect at all the time. And you, we have to get rid of this guilt conscious that we are trying to achieve all of those all the time. It's okay. And nobody's perfect, not, neither men nor women. So uh, that's the one thing I would say, know that you want a career, be very clear about it. And two, get rid of the guilty consciousness that you know you carry around all the time trying to be perfect in everything you do. The other thing is that ask for help. It's okay. So you may have a spouse or a significant other. You may have parents, family, aunts, uncles, friends. It does not matter. When you need it, there's no shame in asking for help. And I can tell you that I would not have survived trying to balance both my family life as well as my career if I did not seek help and I did not get it, right? So it may not just be your, you know, very close family. It can be parent groups at school, as an example, like we're talking about, you know, women with kids who have to balance the two. I've been in many situations where you show up in the last 10 minutes of my child's recital, but I had a very good parent friend who recorded it so when I got home I could talk to her or him about uh, the what the event was and I did show up in the end I was late but I did show up and that's okay and I got to balance the two so that would be my um, my first day the second part of it is that on your career side 
you have to have managers that will uh, measure outcomes rather than micromanage, you know, are you here at 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m., right? So um, I, I would say seek out mentors and managers, and sometimes the mentors find you as well. But it is, it is, it is important that you set up that expectation with your manager. You will do your work, and you will finish it. And it, it has nothing to do with the fact that you have to leave for a doctor's appointment at 3 p.m. or other thing. And be, be, you know, be dependable. When you say you're going to commit to something, make sure you do it, right? So it, they will build trust along the lines as well. Um, that's Komu? Yes. Um, so... I, I I actually, you know, I'm actually going to summarize what you just said so that they, you know, we are creating takeaways from this uh, particular talk today. One is um, you, you know, stop feeling guilty about not being the perfect mother, perfect wife, perfect housekeeper and perfect in everything. So stop that. And if you are serious about your career, make it a serious choice. Um, ask for help um, and uh, and find or have been found by someone who is ready to mentor you as a manager or as a, as a, as your mentor inside the workplace or outside. Did I summarize all of that in uh, well enough, Smitha? Yeah, and, and and I think it's important for you know there's a, there's a certain aspect of you seeking out your mentor, and there are sometimes like Kellyanne said, there was a person who stood up for her and said, "Do not let her leave the you know the DBA function." So sometimes the mentors find you, right? So it, it's important that when those mentors do find you and they reach out to you and give you guidance, that you actually take it, right? So there are people who have gone ahead of you and are going through similar struggles. So it's okay. So do not hesitate to take that. I'll just add one more thing as a takeaway, um, Komal, if you don't mind. It mm -hmm. is that it's okay for you to bring your career into your family too. So as an example, I bring my kids to the office over summer, like for three to four days. It's important for them to know that I have another part of my life and people respect me in my workplace and I do important work, right? So when I do miss one of these big events or I have to go away on a business trip or something like that, they know that it matters to me and I'm making a choice there. So it's also okay to bring your, your kids into your career side, meet your colleagues, right? So it doesn't need to be on a daily basis, but summer's a good time. So that's something that has helped me too. So my kids understand what I do and why it's important I do what I do. All right, great. Um, so uh, since you are already talking, um, my next question is going to be for you again, Smitha. Um, one of the one of the things that I have been uh, noticing, I've worked for Fortune 1,000 companies in the past, actually Fortune 500 companies in the past, and uh, um, and you know the bias almost uh, for women in technology bias almost i felt started from the very get go uh, from the place where you would um, you know from from the interview uh, interview uh, step almost from that point on um, you, and you are deputy chief um, in your workplace what have you noticed in this particular area or uh, or are you thinking of changing anything in your hiring process or anyone who is hiring for you to make a difference in that particular uh, area for bringing more women into into the technology field I think there's um, two things they're focusing on, right? We are in an international organization, so there is a, you know, a definite focus on making sure there is a gender as well as a sort of, a, you know, a nationality balance because we do provide a service to an international community. So, you know, by default, the organization is set up so that you're incentivized to do that. So that's the first positive set. So from an organizational perspective, as long as people know this is important and they're incentivized to do the right things, it's not always hiring a person for the sake of hiring them, but you're hiring the right person for the job and making sure they are set up to succeed, right? So from an organizational perspective, that always helps. 
Second, if you're a hiring manager or you're seeing somebody who's hiring into a position, I always ask people to look for attitude and aptitude, right? So it's not, they may not have a skill immediately. And it may be a particular technology thing like the latest and greatest thing. They have not had 16 months of work experience in deploying that. But when you look at a person's resume and looking at what they have done and talking to their contacts that they provide as references um, and or any work output that you're reviewing, it's important to measure what they have done and how they have achieved it, and what is their breadth of experience, and what is their learning aptitude. That is all. So as long as most women are shortchanged, I believe, when they come up for an interview where they did not change jobs every 10 days, they're not on the cutting edge of technology You know, every six months, they did not move from technology A to technology B, that's okay. Because as long as you can show a learning aptitude, then you can pick up any technology. And you know, if there's one thing in our world that's changed, right? So you may be great at something today and it, it's antiquated in another 16 months. So it, it, it just look for that, right? And two, give them support. I, I, you know, I can tell you that so many cases when you, you, you don't go by perceptions, right? So if it's an internal hire and mostly happens with internal hires is that you hear a story about, you touched on, you know, she's bossy, she's abrasive, she, you know, that's women trying to find their place. We as women, let's make sure that we don't go by perceptions and we make our own calls after we see them in action and at work because there's plenty of stories about women out there to, to sort of you know, set the stage and prevent them from even applying or getting selected. So we as women can be looking out for those things and let's not judge or prejudge. Let's just you know, assess them on their creds and their work ethic and their outcome and nothing else. Lovely, lovely. It actually is a great segue to my next question for Kellen. Um, Kellen, you have worked with so many men, women and men at the same time. My question to you is, uh, and, and, and this question comes from a comment that I heard a couple of uh, months ago where one of my male friends said, well, women don't support women themselves. What do you expect from us? Kellen, do you have any thoughts on that? How should, what should be the actionable item for women or actionable tasks for women to support other women in technology? Well, for one, I think that's changing. Um, you know, this, this goes back to culture again. That, uh, women are kind of raised to police each other, and I think that's changing with the younger generation. I know that from mentoring women myself, that uh, when I first came in, there was this idea that there was only one, one spot at the table. And I didn't understand when some of the other women that were in the community, there was just, you know, a few of them that were older women that weren't too crazy about having me around. And then I started realizing that people were saying, well, I gave you their speaking spot. I gave you their article. And I was like, no wonder they hated me and recognized that I needed to sponsor them and make sure that they were continuing to go along with their career. Um, for me, I have been able to finally pick up women mentors and I will tell you straight out those women mentors have been incredibly supportive of my career I wouldn't have gotten the the uh, career opportunity that I had at Oracle I wouldn't have gotten my salary opportunity at Oracle if it wasn't for a woman mentor that came in and said you should be making this much I will tell you straight out they say that women aren't good at negotiating but boy do they negotiate for each other so I, I don't truly believe that. I also believe that it's important for us, and I do believe this so much in technology. Many of us have gone into technology because we are analytical. I think that it is a bias that many people will see us. Um, I, I can count on you for this, Kamal, to back this up. When we have needed somebody to be more bad cop versus good cop, you're probably not going to call my husband as much. He's an incredibly sensitive, wonderful, warm individual. I'm going to be the one who's probably going to say, no, I don't care what you think about this. It has to be a no. Financially, I'm going to look at the facts and make a decision. And yet people will kind of make this estimate. Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings or I mean, Kellen got a little over emotional about this. No, I'm very, very fact based. I base my decisions on those facts. So there are many times where I have looked at things and people have mean a very keen eye to the facts and make a very you know, logical decision. They'll call me 
And I, I think that we're not really good about that with women, that we don't count on them as much for that. And so my female mentors, I really count on to get those decisions that I need to hear what they really think. And many times they will give me very much more constructive criticism than my male peers. Or my male peers may give criticism based off of bias. My female peers have been there before. And I count on them for that more honest feedback that has that sensitivity built in with it. Very nice. So, so, um, so that kind of leads uh, me to another question for you, Kellen. Um, we just spoke about um, how women should be supporting women, and and you just said that the the things are changing now. It's not um, that uh, you know not that culture anymore where women would not support women. But if you if you have uh, male advocates or male mentors or male managers out there who may be listening today um, or may be listening to this uh, this recording later on, what would you ask uh, ask from a male advocate how to support female technologists to get her through her career path? Um, I don't expect men to really understand what it's like to walk on our shoes every single day. Um, I've had those conversations with the guys where they thought that some of the, um, I guess you'd say, awkward situations that I've had with men online, they said, well, isn't it flattering? No, it's not. It's awkward and it's uncomfortable. And until I kind of immerse them in some of it and share them with them, they, they started to understand. But we're all part of the problem. We're all part of the solution. And many of the men have learned to come to the women's defense that they have sometimes a lot more power in these situations than the women do because the women are already having a challenge with this person that may not be as educated about how to treat women as human beings that the guys can come in and say you know and I've had the situation where I was in an uncomfortable or awkward you know um, incident and a guy has come in and said hey Kellen so-and-so you know is waiting for us over here let's go over here they were able to help me get out of that situation without embarrassing anyone and that's really what most of us want we can say I can embarrass you right now and this is going to be horrible for all of us or this individual, a third party, can come in and get us out of the situation and we can maybe talk about it away from here. We can talk about it outside of being in a public location. And we appreciate that. Um, the guys realize this. The guys that can understand that women are going through this all the time. Whenever you're thinking something about what I'm about to say doesn't seem exactly right, where somebody said, you know, oh, I've already got a female keynote speaker, or oh, I've already got a woman writing on this article. Turn it around, say it the other way. I've already got a male keynote speaker. I've already got a, a man writing on this article. All of a sudden, it sounds a little sillier. And I think that's extremely important to turn it around and realize that bias is incredibly invisible. We all have it. And that having those honest conversations make it a lot easier to get past it and move forward. Um, you know, it's just, it really makes a difference. I mean, it, when I'm going to these events, I'm oh, many times the only female speaker, and many times I'm the only one getting those questions. So who takes care of your kids while you're here? You know, um, Kellen, it's all right for you to travel. Who's taking care of things at home? You know, my husband doesn't get those questions. He just doesn't. Interesting and very interesting observation, uh, Kellen. Thank you. So uh, my next question, um, uh, Samantha, how are we doing on time? Um, we're still doing good. I think another 10 minutes of discussion okay. before questions. Okay, lovely. Um, uh, Smitha, next question is for you. Um, and I'm gonna start that with a, with a personal experience uh, in the beginning of my career and then put the question out for you. Uh, very early in my career, when I was, you know, you know, starting my family, um, I thought networking was uh, was something that needed to be done, but I couldn't because I was I I was a young mother, did not know how to put networking as part of my uh, sort of 
you know, monthly routine or something. And, and I got stagnated for about four years in my career. I was not going anywhere. I had to prove once I remember uh, one of my managers telling me, oh, for that promotion, you have to walk on water. And I really thought I was walking on water already. So, and, and in the same, um, at the same level, the men were progressing, doing lesser than what I was doing. So that was pretty irritating in, in the beginning of the career. The only thing that I could uh, differentiate between myself and the male peers that I was working with was networking. I would not go for beer bashes after work because I had kids. Uh, I would not go for um, you know those conferences at that time I had little kids. Or I did not pay attention to networking as a required activity to progress in your career. What's your thought on networking? Is it an over, um, uh, you know, uh, overstretched uh, part of our lives, or should should we consider networking as a, as an important piece in our career? Um, okay, so I have an interesting perspective. I think things are changing. I'll start by saying that you know, you know, in the past, uh, decisions about who gets promoted make could have been made on the golf course and with the global uh, economy and you know the globalization of pretty much everybody is connected to everything some of that culture is uh, you know sort of changing but i can completely sort of empathize with where you were because that's where i was too so since i put in my 100% of you know at work and i thought that the time after work was dedicated to my family i never could you know do the um, happy hours after work or you know go out and hang out somewhere till seven or eight or nine. I, I just couldn't do it, right? But I, I had to find an alternate medium and I took a different path to it. I still don't. So I've been in the industry for about 20 years and unless something, it's a big important event, I do not still do those things. So it's, it's a personal choice, right? And you're trying to balance your, your work in life. So instead though, you cannot not network. So you have to find other venues. So what I found out that you could initiate other events during lunchtime, maybe a potluck. It could be a, a success um, event. You're just gonna throw a little you know, thing with a group of your colleagues to say, to celebrate a success. You could invite your managers, you could invite your colleagues, you could invite your subordinates. So other than the regular type of networking that has, happens after work, you yourself can introduce a change in the culture to introducing them during work. So it may it be lunchtime, coffee times, it could be a cake cutting, whatever it is. You're trying to build sort of events where you get to meet people and people can talk about what they're doing, the opportunities they come up. And most of these informal conversations lead to something positive in the end, right? So my suggestion would be that if you are trying, you're stretched trying to, to fit both work and life, find other ways to network. So it all doesn't have to be after work. So that's one part of it. Two is that, um, you know, as long as you do your job and you're dependable in other things, you need others to speak on your behalf. So what I have also learned is that when you speak about yourself, it is not heard with the same kind of um, openness when somebody else speaks about you. So you have to find those people who might be at these networking events, might be in a performance review discussion, might be in a workforce planning discussion, who's gonna speak on behalf of you. So this could be a mentor. So you have to choose, like I said, the mentors, sometimes they find you, sometimes you have to find them, but you could have those people who are attending these events speak about you. They don't need to say much. All they need to say is like, I think she did a brilliant job on such and such activity, or and I never thought they would pull it off and you know, she was great. So that's where the stories, the tribal stories about she walks on water, et cetera, comes from, right? So as long as it's said enough, that perception set, then you're good to go. So you may not be there, but you need to now find uh, people who can speak on your behalf. And I have learned that it's received much more openness than when you speak about yourself. I'd conclude by saying that it's, it's also, a, you know, some of these things are part luck. Who who do you who do you know as well? But doing your job, knowing what you do well, 
is a prerequisite for all of this, right? So also put in the effort there because people can't speak about something they cannot be authentic about. So being there, being dependable, doing your job, deliver when you say you will, when you can't be transparent about it, know your stuff, the basics, um, to the decisions why you made something, you know, with clarity, that also sort of helps. I don't know if that answered your question, Como. Oh, it did. It absolutely did. So basically what you're saying is uh, uh, networking is not only the standard, the, the cliched networking that we think about, especially for young entrepreneurs who are starting or young, I keep saying entrepreneurs, young technologists uh, who are starting their career or, and at the same time thinking about starting a family, normal networking hours that are considered networking, you know, after work hours may not be possible, but that doesn't mean that you stop networking. And um, I did find that uh, myself. It's uh, it's interesting that you say that, uh, Smitha, because I'm a good cook. So what I started doing was I would make something and take it to the break room and invite everyone, and that would start conversations. And it was my way of uh, sort of networking. Once I realized that I was missing out on the conversations which were happening after after work hours so it's it's a great uh, great way of networking without sitting uh, at the bar with the rest of the colleagues that you may not be able to do as a young mother so great um, i i love i love this answer so kellen you are um uh, you are an, a traveler a traveler i yeah. i can't even tell you guys I never see her. Um, I I I, see, I have to get on her get on her calendar because she's speaking. Either you know she would be in Finland, and the next thing you know she's in Singapore, and she's you know all over the world speaking. And it's all about technology. Um, one question, and I think we are coming um, uh, to the to the top of the hour here for, and we have to leave some uh, time for questions. How do you balance that kind of work with your uh, with your life in general, with kids and everything, just you know, quick answer on that, because I do yeah. admire you on and in, in this particular field. Um, I lucked out that I do have very independent children. Uh, between Tim and I, we have five kids, um, ages seventeen through twenty-seven, and I do have a very good partner. But um, I couldn't have done this when they were younger. I didn't join the user report. I didn't start professionally speaking until my youngest was about nine years old. And, um, you know, before that, I was writing and blogging and just putting things out online. But um, it, it does have a lot to do with that, balancing things out, making sure that you have good connections. Um, I didn't have family near. I, I was very much a I joke about being an army of one, but it was essential. I will tell you, technology is my friend. I have an Uber family account. I know when my 22-year-old my is in an Uber and where he's going at all times. Uh, same thing with my 20-year-old. I love Uber. I love Messenger. I mean, a kid can, you know, text me and say, hey, mom, I'm having this problem. Can you help me out? Or, you know, it makes a big difference. Uh, but, you know, it has a lot to do with technology, and I believe in work-life balance. I interview my bosses longer than they interview me. I don't believe that you leave companies. I believe you leave managers. So I have to say that very strongly is having a manager that understands a strong work-life balance and that I work from home um, if I'm not traveling. And usually it's traveling, you know, two times out of a month for maybe three to four days max. This month will be a little different. I'm doing 21 days of the month of November. No Thanksgiving for me. And we'll, we'll see if I survive at the end of this. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, so basically, uh, you started creating your brand prior to getting on the road by using technology, writing the blogs and, and getting the awareness out. And when your kids were at that point where you could get out and be outside of the house, uh, that's when you started traveling quite a bit. Is that a right um, assessment? Absolutely. And, you know, we were talking about networking. I did a lot of online networking. Uh, anytime I do go to an event, I make sure that I connect with everyone on LinkedIn. It is a non-creepy stalker type kind of situation where you can connect with folks and start having communication. Um, I, I do strongly believe in that. Uh, you know, I network via with 
email and with online forums. And I was well known before I ever started speaking and people were interested in having somebody who was technically qualified. That was a woman speaking, especially in the Microsoft community, as I've told many folks, um, many of the events have a goal of 50% female speakers, which is a lofty goal, which I'm quite amazed with. And I would love to see it happen more on the Oracle side. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, Samantha, we are at uh, one o'clock, uh, 10 minutes from uh, closing this uh, session out. Do you have any questions for us, uh, for the panelists? Um, I don't have any typed in at the moment, but if you are a, an attendee and you do have a question for panelists, um, please type them in the question box now. Um, I know some of you must have a question out there for, um, for our panelists. Um, and I'm going to give the opportunity because, as normal, I am traveling and I am about to start a session here at the East Coast Oracle User Group Conference in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to disappear. But if anybody has any questions for me, please feel free. I'm easy to find. I'm DBA Kevlar, so I'm the Bulletproof Database Administrator. You can find me on Twitter. You can email me at dbakevlar at gmail.com. I'm always glad to answer questions or give insight. But with that, I'm probably going to disappear from this webinar. I want to thank everyone for allowing me this opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, Kellen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll catch you the next time I have an opening in my calendar, dears. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Sam, if we don't have any questions, I, I know even Smitha is uh, traveling uh, to, at, uh, in, uh, to Redwood Shores, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, we can give uh, her nine minutes back <laughs> so that she can be in her next meeting uh, from this point. Yeah. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, any attendee, please, you know, you know all uh, three of us now. You can reach out to Samantha. Please feel free to uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, uh, Sam, you can put my Twitter handle out um, and Kellen's Twitter handle out as well. Uh, we would be more than happy to uh, help out in any um, questions you have and even discuss if there is a situation where you want some someone to discuss through uh, career related or family related, which is, um, you know, which is making you decide one way or the other if you want to stay in the technology field or not please feel free to reach out. Please feel free to reach out. We are here to help each other. Women have to support each other uh, in, in, in this, in, in this uh, area. Um, I did find one question if you guys have enough time. Go ahead. Um, uh, it says, picking up on the women, policing women, how can you as a manager prevent this from happening? Smitha, you wanna take that? Can you repeat the question? Yes, um, it says picking up on the women policing women. How can you as a manager prevent this from happening? Okay, so I think the first thing is that um, sometimes you, you have to be the party who's going to hold other people accountable. Um, so speak when others can't speak. So if you have a junior member who is, you know, you sort of being, you think I'll use the word targeted, um, if you know, uh, but you have to be the voice of reason and you have to call them out privately, publicly, whichever measure it takes. So you have to be in the place where you are going to be the party who's going to hold others accountable when you are in that position. So if you're a manager, I'm assuming then that you have that power and you're going to do that as part of your function and be very clear. This happens so often and it's very easy to miss and say, okay, I'm not going to react or respond. And it does not have to be in an abrasive manner in a public venue. It can be done privately after the fact too, but you have to speak for them. Did I answer your question? Yes. Um, and I can, I can add to that, um, Smitha, um, as, you know, as a, as a person who is not a manager and is being, and is, is a, uh, woman in technology is being is being uh, policed by other women who are on top of her. It can be a very tricky situation, to be honest with you. Where you know, um, I have had this happen with me personally, where my manager was a woman and a technologist, but had no uh, kids of her own, um, and and I was pregnant uh, at that time. So it was a very interesting situation where she would not understand what I was going through. Uh, regardless, 
um, regardless, what I did was in that situation was I had a, I had a, um, I had a dialogue with her. I had a, I sat down with her and asked, where can I change to make you feel more comfortable that I'm not wasting time? I am, if I'm working from home on a day, I have a doctor's appointment. What will make you feel better? Um, if, uh, what is it that I you want me to do that will make you feel better so that you're not chasing me thinking that I'm not working? So having that open conversation got her to realize that she was policing me. She probably was not even thinking it. I think that was her micromanaging nature that was making her do that. So, um, so from that standpoint, I was able to have an open dialogue and have that behavior change a little bit because I was not a manager. But what happened when I became a manager, I made sure I was not behaving the way my manager was uh, behaving back then. So back to you, Smitha. Um, yes, as a manager, I do agree that you need to make sure that you are uh, eating your own dog food, making sure you're not policing whether they're males or females. It doesn't matter, to be honest with you. Uh, I could add but, do you agree? Yes, and if I could just add one more perspective to that, is that in, in some of those cases where you do have a discussion with such an individual, right, and you say, why is that you sort of did this or was micromanaging or policing or whatever that might, the term might be, and sometimes you will be surprised to hear what, why they acted that way. They had to walk a very hard path to get to where they were, and they are now looking at you as somebody and they hold you to a higher standard to make sure that you're, there's not a perception about you that either you're remote working too much or maybe not delivering, et cetera. So sometimes it, these kind of activities also come from good intentions, however executed badly, right? So having that conversation helps you understand where they're coming from and also reset their expectation that that was not the way to address that issue, right? So there's exactly. not many other ways to do it too. So I just exactly. want to add the perspective of some of these conversations leading to them, they're just not being mean or being obnoxious or, you know, non-understanding, but the fact that they are holding you to a higher standard because they have to themselves walk a very hard path to get to where they are today. Exactly. So it brings us, it's, it's full circle back, uh, Smitha, from very first slide that we, you know, as women, we have to work a little harder <laughs> to get where we are than men ever would have to. So with that, thank you so much, Smitha. Thanks, uh, Sam, for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk openly about these uh, couple of issues we have not touched. You know, this is, there is a plethora of issues that we can be talking about but you know given the time we could touch some of it and hopefully there were some points that our attendees would take home and uh, create actionable items out of those so uh, having said that uh, thank you again and we will uh, we will wait for attendees to uh, reach out to us and uh, follow us on um, on twitter or on linkedin Yep, I just want to say thank you to both of you. And then if the attendees do have questions, you can email me. You can comment on Kamal's blog on the blog at oeg.org slash blog. Um, and I'll get them to the panelists as well. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Mother. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.